Okay, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, this is the uh, Prague AI Meetup, AI and Deep Learning Meetup, um, hosted by H2O AI, which is a company um, with an office in Prague. We're also in California, which is where I'm coming from, which is why you don't hear a Czech accent in my English. Um, but our, our second biggest office is in Prague, so we have quite a big team, and you probably see some people with the t-shirts on around here. Um, those people probably work at H2O. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to, we're gonna, you were promised a, a a, a drawing for a prize. So <laughs> there's the Prague um, ML 2020 uh, conference coming up. I'm not sure exactly what month it is, but it's coming up in the future. And everybody who registered for this meetup uh, sometime before today, I think, I don't remember what time the cutoff was, maybe around noon today, we, we collected all the names. And then we're, we're just going to draw a winner for a free ticket to this, uh, to this meetup. So, First, before we get started, I'm just going to do that real quick. Um, so we have... <clears throat> we have copy-pasted your names into this random name picker, and, and hopefully this works. We'll try it out. Um, so let's get started. The winner is <laughs> Michal Stewart. Yep. Yeah, that's you. Okay. Congratulations. We don't have anything to give you right now, but we're gonna we're gonna take a screenshot of your name and um, and then the organizers for the conference will send you an email for your ticket. So congratulations. <laughs> Let me just uh, record your name so I don't forget. Uh, okay. All right. So. <clears throat> okay. The next thing I need to do, I just need to start recording uh, this thing here. Okay. Oops. Okay, <clears throat> so we should be recording this, um, so hopefully uh, that will work. So my name is Erin Liddell. I'm the um, Chief Machine Learning Scientist at H2O AI, which I mentioned uh, briefly already is a company, um, we have an office in Prague and, and also Mountain View, California and a few other places uh, like New York and we have a few smaller offices in Canada and India and a few other countries. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is um, scalable automatic machine learning in H2O. So. Um, all of those things we'll touch on, the scalability, the AutoML components, and then um, H2O. And so I'll just say a little bit more about the company in case you're um, not familiar. I think a lot of you, is this your first time at our, at our meetup? If it is, could you raise your hand? Okay, cool. So probably a lot of you um, are new to H2O, the software, and also the company. So I'll just say a few things about us. Um, so that's the name of the company. It's also the name of a software tool that we produce at H2O. So the company's been around since uh, 2012. And it was um, started back then, uh, if you can remember, if any of you were working in the machine learning or data science field back then, um, that was when everybody started talking about big data and Hadoop and things like that. So at that time, there was no machine learning platform uh, that would really work for big data or would be fast and scale to, to large data sets. So that was the goal of the company, was to create a, a machine learning library for that. And um, the software is open source. So everything that I'm talking about tonight, you can just download however you like. Um, you can use it through R or Python. Um, those are the two main ways that people use the software, but you can also 
um, uh, use it from Scala. The, the algorithms themselves are, are written in Java. Um, and then we also have a web interface. If you don't want to write any code, you can also just use the web interface. So yeah, so h2o.ai is the name of the company. That's also uh, the, our website, h2o.ai. And H2O is the platform. We also have a number of other um, tools that we produce at H2O. Some of them are open source, some of them are not. So if you see um, some of the signs around here, there's one of our other big tools, which is also an AutoML tool. It's called Driverless AI. Um, I'm not going to be talking about that tonight, but that's just something to uh, be aware of. We have, we have other tools that kind of specialize in different things. Um, and uh, you can go to our website and learn more about the different things there. So like I said, we're, we're in California. Um, okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So just first I'm going to introduce what a H2O is, what the platform is. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what AutoML is or automatic machine learning. And then I'll show you how to use the AutoML functionality inside of H2O. And then I'll, I'll give you some other resources that are related to H2O. And then this URL here, if you, I don't know if you can see it in the back. I think we have some screens in the back so you might be able to see it. But if you click on this link, you'll be able to find um, a, a place on the internet where we have all of our presentations from meetups. So this will bring you to a GitHub repository. And if you scroll down, there'll be a folder that will say uh, the date uh, of today. And then it will say AI. Probably meet up and you'll look inside there and, and there'll be a PDF with, with these slides. So if you want to review them later, that's where you can find them. So if you want to take a picture of that link or anything, feel free to do that. You can also ask me at the end of the, the talk. Okay, so first we'll talk about the H2O platform. So I mentioned before this was created in the time of, of Hadoop. Um, when that was becoming quite popular. So uh, what H2O is, is it's a platform. So I would, I would distinguish um, between a machine learning library and a platform. A platform would be something that also um, includes its own, sort of everything that it needs to, to function. So we actually have our own uh, data frame, distributed data frame structure. Um, so that would be maybe be different than like a scikit-learn, which is more of a library which uses um, external um, functionality to, to function. So we actually implement the whole, everything that we need to, um, to do the machine learning, including the, the data structures from scratch. And all of the algorithms are uh, implemented by us uh, from scratch in Java, and they're, they'll work, work in multi-core no, uh, multi on your single laptop. So if you wanted to have, you know, eight, um, so a normal laptop might have eight cores on it. It would be like eight times as fast if you run on a laptop. And then if you have d data that's bigger than can fit into RAM on a, on a single laptop or a single computer, you can um, start up a cluster of multiple nodes and um, run it across that. So I mentioned already that the algorithms are written in Java, but most, most people who use this library are data scientists um, so, and also engineers, but uh, we found that you know, data scientists generally like R and Python, those are the two most popular languages, so, so we make sure that anyone, anyone can use the library. And that's also useful if you're working in a team where some people like Python, some people like R, you don't have to fight. Uh, everybody can be using whatever um, interface they would like and producing the same thing at the end. Um, and then one of the other, or a couple of the other things that are unique about H2O is that uh, because we are in Java, we can easily deploy these models into production. Um, something that uh, like is common when you're using like an, an R Python library that's um, maybe not designed for production uses, you have a, a team of data scientists who might prototype something in R Python, and then you have another team of engineers who then re-implement what they did in Java or C++. And so you kind of have this duplication of, of efforts. And um, what we're trying to do is make that more seamless so you're not duplicating anything. It's just one, one single system. And then I mentioned a couple times already that this, this can work on Hadoop, it can work on Spark, 
Um, but if you don't use those technologies, that doesn't matter. It's, you don't have to use Hadoop or Spark. And in fact, if you don't need to use those, it's better not to. So you could just run it on your laptop if that's, you know, you have pretty small data, or if you have very big data, you might have um, a bigger machine or a server or a cluster of machines. Okay, so just a few, um, <clears throat> a few terms that I'll define. So this, this is uh, maybe the most technical slide that I have um, in terms of um, talking about distributed computing. So we have two things. One is um, something that we call the H2O cluster. And um, people get a little bit confused about this. Sometimes they, um, we have a lot of people that think that this is uh, like a cloud-based service. So when they start up the H2O cluster, um, that's actually just running locally on your laptop or on your uh, computer or maybe you're running it on Amazon EC2 or some other cloud provider but you have the control over that so there's no such thing as like um, an H2 cloud where we're running you know the tools and then giving you the results back so just to be clear the H2 cluster is a local thing that just runs um, on your machine and really what it is is just a Java process where all of the everything happens so that's where your data is that's where your models are, um, that's where you're training the models, it's just a, a block of memory and that's what we call the H2O cluster. And so the first thing that you do when you're writing some code using H2O is you would start up the H2O cluster and then you, you know, train some models, load data, etc. And then um, the other thing that we, we have is something that we call the H2O frame. And I mentioned before um, when sort of defining H2O as a platform, we actually have our own distributed computing environment, so um, including distributed data frames. So if you're using R or Python, you don't have to think about, I mean, if you're using any of the APIs, you don't really have to think about this. It's just, um, you can pretend it's an R data frame or a pandas data frame and it works just the same. It's just underneath, um, if you're using uh, a cluster, uh, some of the rows will be on one node, some of the rows will be on another node, and that's how we distribute the data. And then all of the nodes will talk to each other when necessary and communicate um, as needed. And the reason that we do that is because you might have uh, a training set that's, let's say, 100 gigabytes uh, of data. And you know, if you want to train that on a sort of a normal size machine, uh, let's say you have a computer with 64 gigs of RAM or even like 20, 24 gigs of RAM or something like that, that data doesn't fit into RAM. So um, that's when we have to start having uh, a cluster of computers and then some of the rows of that data will go on one machine, some will go on another, and then we revisit this whole idea of an H2O frame. So that's why we were able to do that and that's why H2O is a scalable library. You just basically keep adding nodes to your H2O cluster to make it big enough to fit the data. And one of the reasons that we did that is because back, back around 2012-2013, um, Amazon EC2 became like a very cheap way to do computing. So, um, and it's still a very cheap way, at least for CPUs, uh, a very cheap way to do computing. So we're trying to take advantage of like, what's the cheapest way that we can do this? It's very expensive to either buy or rent a machine that has one terabyte of RAM, but it's very cheap to uh, you know, rent out 10 instances that are 64 gigs of RAM each, something like that. So the, the goal was to make something that could be run cheaply. So inside of H2O, it's, it looks like a, any kind of normal machine learning library like scikit-learn. Um, if you're Python people in this room, you're probably familiar with scikit-learn. So we'll have like similar functionality, so a bunch of different algorithms. So we have uh, supervised algorithms and we have unsupervised algorithms. Um, some examples are gradient boosting machine, random forest. We have uh, deep neural networks, um, GLM. We also have XGBoost, which is actually a third party library that we bundle into H2O because it's, it's very good and we wanted it inside of H2O, so we put it in there. And that's the nice thing about open source. Um, and a whole bunch of other algorithms. There's a whole list of them on, um, in the user guide, which I, I'll point you to later. Um, yeah, so a bunch of different machine learning algorithms. All of those are distributed, scalable, 
um, our own implementations with the exception of XGBoost. And then we also like to do things, um, this, this bullet point here differs a little bit from scikit-learn. So if you're used to that library, you have to do a lot of things manually to process the data at the beginning. So if you have categorical data, you have to convert that into numeric data somehow before you can do machine learning. Um, we like to do all of that stuff automatically so that you don't have to repeat these steps every time you're writing code. Um, so we'll do, <coughs> we'll handle some basic pre-processing of the data. So if you have missing data, we'll fill that in for you. If you need to normalize the columns, we'll do that for you. If you need to do something with the categorical data, we'll do that for you, like one hot encoding or some other type of categorical encoding. So we'll do all of that automatically. Um, another nice feature of H2O is we have something that's called automatic early stopping. So what that means is that um, <clears throat> a lot of algorithms, for example, like the GBM or gradient boosting machine, um, it's easy to overfit those algorithms. So you, you train, um, and these are all sort of iterative algorithms, so they learn a little bit at a time, and then at a certain point you need to stop um, stop it from learning because then it kind of starts to memorize the data and not uh, be able to predict well on future data. So uh, you, can, you can sort of manually do that if you start looking at the training error versus the test error and it's sort of this just thing that data scientists do to tune their models. We have something that can sort of automatically do that for you so I find that to be uh, very useful. And then um, things related to machine learning but aren't necessarily algorithms are um, we have the ability to do cross-validation, grid search, random search. So these are all just uh, functionality that you need to, to tune and to evaluate your models. And then once you've trained the models, we have um, variable importance for everything so you can understand um, which of your features are most predictive and important. We have all different evaluation metrics, so you can um, compare models against each other and some plots and some other things like that. So generally we like to just put everything, everything that you can think of what, that you need to do for machine learning inside the single library so that you're not um, having to use a whole bunch of other software at the same time. Okay, so any questions about uh, H2O so far? We'll also have time for questions at the end. We'll do like a QA. and a um, So, okay, you can save your questions for the end too. <clears throat> okay, so now we're just gonna talk about AutoML or automatic machine learning. So there's, uh, it's not a very well-defined term. So when somebody says AutoML, they might be talking about a lot of different things. So um, what I think is important to do is just talk about what are some of the goals of AutoML and, and some of the features, because um, I don't know that we can all agree upon exactly what AutoML is as a community, so I think let's just talk about um, what are some of the goals with automatic machine learning. So I think probably the most, um, the most important goal, at least in my opinion, would be training the best model with the least amount of time or effort. And so that could mean um, the least amount of time in terms of training, like compute time, um, but also the amount of time that it takes for the user or the data scientist to write all the code and to, to make that happen. So there's kind of two, two um, amounts of time that we're trying to minimize. And um, yeah, so, and both are important because if your models only take an hour to train, but it takes you, you know, five or six hours to write a bunch of code to, to do that, then, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if it's one hour and one hour and ten minutes, it's like the six hours ahead is actually the, the more annoying thing uh, to, to reduce. So I think the goal is just getting the best model with the least amount of effort. And um, if we make it easy, so another aspect of AutoML tools is they, they try to simplify the interface so that it's uh, very easy to use. So all you really should be having to do when you're using an AutoML tool is uh, point it at your data and say, this is my training set, this is the thing that I want to predict, and um, 
maybe you can also specify like what is it that you're trying to measure are you trying to maximize AUC are you trying to minimize mean squared error so maybe you can specify what it is what it is that your goal is in terms of a metric and then maybe how long do you want it to, to work for so I think that pretty much covers what an interface for an AutoML tool should look like you could have other things that would allow you to uh, override things or to you know have more advanced settings but I think you shouldn't have to do more than those three things. And so that also means that you don't have all these different hyperparameters and tuning things that you can, that you have to mess around with. Um, and that makes it easier for people that haven't been a data scientist for as long. So let's say, you know, you've been doing data science for like six months or a year, and maybe, you know, you know about a random forest, you know about a GLM, maybe you've heard of GBMs, but you haven't tried them out yet. Um, it takes a long time to learn how to tune all those different algorithms and even just to know what all the algorithms are and um, it could take years to really become an expert at that so um, but by the time you've been a data scientist for a couple of months you kind of have the general idea about what you're doing you're giving it a training set and you're trying to get a good model and, and you know the thing you're trying to predict so if that's all you need to know then um, then you know somebody who's very new to data science could use an AutoML tool and get really good models uh, fairly quickly. So, <clears throat> um, so that's that's one aspect. Is it it opens the door to a lot more people that have uh, less experience or expertise. Um, but also, even if you're an expert in machine learning, it's just going to save you a lot of time because you're not writing so much code all the time. So one of the reasons that um, that we decided to make this tool is because, I mean, for me personally, I was writing the same code over and over again and like copy pasting like a bunch of things that I always do every time I start a new machine learning problem. Um, and it just didn't make any sense that, to do that. So I, I had kind of a technique in my head of all the things I wanted to try. And then, you know, basically we just put a wrapper function around that. And <clears throat> so, yeah, so this, this is just to, to make it easier to, even if you know how to do all that stuff and you know how to tune all the algorithms, this should um, make your process faster. So if you're a data scientist at a company or somewhere, um, instead of working on a single problem you know, for two weeks, maybe you could work on three or four or five problems in that same two weeks because you're, you're not spending so much time writing code and evaluating models. <clears throat> And the last point is just, um, it's kind of a nice thing, like let's say you're um, somebody in some scientific discipline and a lot of research right now um, in, in science is, is taking old problems and applying machine learning to it and then you instantly have progress. So, you know, let's say you're doing some sort of medical diagnostic thing and everybody's been using some formula for, you know, 50 years and all of a sudden you have some data, you apply machine learning to it, and you get a better uh, result. So that's a very easy way, like if you're in academia, also to write papers, you just find a bunch of things that haven't been touched with machine learning before and you apply machine learning and then you have instant progress. So what would be nice to see is, um, in scientific disciplines, is people using AutoML tools because then um, usually if you're not, maybe you're, um, some other type of scientist, not a data scientist, you don't know exactly you know, what to do. You know the basics of machine learning, but um, you might not be able to get the best results that you could get if you're just doing that by, on your own. So it might be nice to have um, you know, a lot of people trying AutoML tools, and then in your paper you can write, here's all the algorithms that the tool tried, and here's what we found was the best one. And you kind of like, um, Makes your, ma makes your job easier and it makes the paper uh, or the research better because it's, it's not just you trained one random forest and said the result, you, you did a whole exhaustive search. So I think that that can help um, improve science as well. So here's just a few um, uh, aspects of machine learning in general. So, um, or I should say data science maybe, but so in, in the process of having a data set and trying to train a model, there's a couple different pieces. So at the beginning, you um, are maybe more focused on preparing the data, 
um, maybe doing some feature engineering, some feature reduction, who knows, like all sorts of stuff related to the data. And then once you have your you know, data in a good place, then you can try to train a whole bunch of models. And then, because um, really in advance, like you can't really predict in advance what model is going to work well on your, or what algorithm is going to work well on your data set. So generally, the process of data science or machine learning is training a whole bunch of models and then finding which one is the best. Um, I think that in the future of AutoML, that's actually going to be what we, what we do. We actually can just predict which algorithms are good and then we skip the whole spending a lot of money on the cloud and then we can uh, be done with our job easier. That's not really where AutoML is yet, but that's kind of where it's headed. So this, but right now it's, it's, um, it's still be, maybe too hard to predict which, which algorithms are going to be good, so we just end up having to try everything or try a whole bunch of things. And then, um, and then at the end, um, a technique that's used often uh, if you're trying to get the best performance possible is to combine several models together. Um, how many of you have heard of Kaggle.com before? Okay, so maybe like half, half of the people. So <coughs> for those of you who don't <coughs> know what Kaggle is, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's a website where you compete against other data scientists to win prizes. And basically, you'll have a competition, and the competition centers around a particular data set. And they say, here's um, a data set. This is the thing that we're trying to predict. And we're going to measure everybody based on some metric, like AUC or mean squared error. And then everybody just tries to train a bunch of models, and everybody uh, fights against each other, and then they, you know, they submit their predictions on a test set where only Kaggle has the answers, and then Kaggle ranks everybody on what they call leaderboard. And so you see a, a big, you know, basically table of teams and then their scores, and then after a certain amount of time, like let's say a month or two months, then the competition is over, and then you have winners, and then. Um, yeah, so then it's just this whole community of people that um, love doing this. And anyway, the, the point of me mentioning this is that part of um, winning in Kaggle is using ensembles. So it's pretty hard to win Kaggle with just a single model. Um, if you combine many models together, you get a more powerful model. And that, what that's, that's called ensembling. So if our goal is to get the best model, generally at the end you want to ensemble them together. Um, sometimes that's not your goal. So sometimes maybe your goal is to, you know, have the, you know, best model with the fastest prediction speed or maybe the most interpretable model or some other way of measuring um, what a good model is for you. But if all you care about is the performance, um, how well that thing is predicting what it's trying to predict, then we just want to ensemble things together and combine the power of many models. So here's those same uh, three categories, but I'm, I'm just kind of outlining, uh, outlining a few more things in detail. Um, so in the data preprocessing category, I've already mentioned um, the first bullet. This is all stuff that we do already in H2O, sort of for free. Um, you don't have to write any code to do it. Um, then that could, this could also include feature selection and feature extraction. And then the third bullet is actually very important, and you'll also see people doing this a lot on Kaggle. Um, it's just, if you have categorical data in your training set, that can sometimes present a lot of different, uh, different issues for the machine learning algorithm. So in particular, if you have a, ca a, a column that has a lot of different categories. So one of the um, examples that we see this often is, let's say you have some uh, addresses or you know, location data in your, in your training set. And one of the columns is um, postal code. Um, well, postal code, I don't, does anybody know how many postal codes there are in the Czech Republic? Anybody? There's probably a lot, but in the US it's like 40,000 or something like that. So, um, you know, maybe several thousand or 10,000 or more postal codes. So with regular um, 
most machine learning algorithms will require you to turn that data into some numeric res representation. So the simplest thing to do is to take each of those 40,000 um, categories and make a new column, one for each level, and turn that into binary indicator columns. So you say, this zip code, yes or no, zero or one. This zip code, yes or no, zero or one. And it just balloons the data out into like this much wider, more difficult representation of the data. And then <clears throat> even algorithms that don't require that, so some, <clears throat> um, some tree-based algorithms like Random Forest and GBM, if you have, um, like for example, the H2O implementation doesn't require you to do that uh, encoding of the categories, but it will add a lot of time um, to the training time if you have 40,000 different levels. So that's what I call like problematic data. So one thing is you could just drop that column and forget about it, but it's probably um, containing some useful information. So there's different types of things that we can do to, to recode that data into something more amenable to machine learning. And one of, the, one of the techniques is called target encoding, and that's, I'm not gonna explain what it is, but you essentially turn each category into a number, just like a single number, um, so that you can just keep one column and uh, still get some value out of it. So this is, these are all techniques that, as you go on in your data science career, you'll start to learn more and more tricks like this. Um, so yeah, I would include that in the data pre-processing category. Um, then in terms of model generation, there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can just create models. So you could just manually create, you know, five or ten models, your favorite ones with the favorite hyperparameters. Or you could do something a bit more um, sys uh, systematic, like create a grid search. So that's, you're sort of identifying all the hyperparameters that you want to tune. So for example, in a random forest, we might have like, the maximum tree depth, or the sample rate, or um, the minimum number of observations per node. So these are all, think about them as like little knobs that you have to tune, and there's some combination of these knobs that gives you the best model, but you, and your job as a data scientist is just to keep tuning these knobs until it spits out something good. And that's essentially what we do. <laughs> so it's not very sophisticated, but this is, this is basically what data science is. Um, but there's ways to sort of make an instruction set for how to, how to do this in a more organized way. So that would be grid search. And then you can also do kind of a random search where you just try a bunch of different values and then eventually you'll find something good. Um, then there's another technique that's called Bayesian hyperparameter optimization. Um, that's a bit smarter of a technique, but it's um, something that can't be done uh, in parallel. So you have to do one step at a time. So it takes longer to do that. So sometimes then it might make more sense to just do a big random search in parallel. You'll get to the, a better model quicker than something more sophisticated. So it just depends um, you know, on a lot of different things, which, which techniques you want to use to generate models. OK, and then for ensembling, there's, a, of course, also a couple different ways to do this. So the way that I'm going to talk about today is called stacking or stacked ensembles. How many people have heard of stacked, stacked ensembles before? OK, cool. Um, so that's just a type of kind of sort of a technique or an algorithm that what it does is it makes a combination. It, it tells you using, you basically use machine learning to learn what the best combination of the models is. So it's like two levels of machine learning happening. Um, and that's why it works well, is because you don't put any of your like human ideas into what it should be. You just let the, the data learn, or the algorithm learn from the data. And then it comes up with some combination of how to combine those models that, that's supposed to be best. And then there's another type of ensemble that's called ensemble selection. But I'm not going to go into detail about that. but just. Be aware there's all different ways of doing things, and your goal as, as a data scientist is kind of forging a path through all these options as quick as you can to get to the best model. So it's a lot of decisions that have to be made and a lot of considerations that you have to make. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Um, so the next thing I'm just going to show you here is just a link. Um, you probably can't read that, but I'll read it to you. It's, it's uh, tinyurl.com slash flavors dash of dash AutoML. So um, this is just a blog post that you can read if you want to learn more about all the different types of AutoML. So, and by types, I kind of mean like the different techniques that are used to achieve the goal of finding the best model. Um, so, probably the most, um, uh, the biggest distinction in terms of AutoML techniques is stuff for deep learning and then stuff for not deep learning. So, for deep learning, the goal is really just to, it's, it's something that's called neural architecture search. And the goal is really to find the optimal architecture of your network. And that's essentially what AutoML is in, in deep learning world. And that's a very different um, approach. And um, so if you want to, if you're in the, if you're finding yourself using deep learning, so let's say you have image data, like basically if you have image data and sometimes if you have text data, um, or more complex signals like audio or video, you're probably going to need to use deep learning because that's what that's good at. But if you have tabular data, like a, like looks like a matrix or an Excel spreadsheet, then you're kind of, you can use deep learning, but you're probably going to not be getting as good of results as with all the other techniques like gradient boosting machines, random forest. That's not always the case, but that's um, in general how I think you can divide up machine learning into these two categories, and it's based on what your data looks like. So, but a lot of times people these days are just doing deep learning for everything because everybody's talking about deep learning all the time. So, um, if you find yourself doing that, you should maybe also consider, if you have tabular data, some of these other algorithms that have been around um, for longer and well, deep learning has been around for just as long as everything else, but essentially, um, yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. So this just goes into some detail about all the different types of AutoML and some of the different software packages and open source tools as well. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about how do we do AutoML inside H2O. So here's just that same slide from before. Um, and what I'm doing here is just highlighting all the stuff that we currently are doing with our, our AutoML. So before I'm just speaking generally, here's all the stuff that we could try to automate in all these different um, ways, but this is kind of what we've come up with uh, for, for us. So for data pre-processing, we have just this stuff here right now. Um, this will go, we're doing automatic target encoding, which is going to go into H2O AutoML very soon. Um, you can still do manual target encoding and then apply AutoML right now, but we're trying to automate that process. And then after that, we're going to address um, the feature, feature selection <coughs> um, category. So if you have very wide data, um, <clears throat> right now you probably want to do something with that before using H2O AutoML. But in the next versions, we'll, we'll try to do all of this automatically. Um, in terms of model generation, what we, what we do is we use random grid search. And the reason that we do that is, one, it's, um, it's very easy to parallelize uh, this. And it's fast. And um, it's what we already have in H2O. So it just makes sense to just use what we have. We're probably going to add something like this, maybe not exactly Bayesian hyperparameter optimization, it might be something uh, slightly different, but for now what we do is um, just a random search across all of our algorithms, and then we do the you know, automatic early stopping to make sure we're not overfitting, and then we train a few different stacked ensembles at the end. And, um, so why do we do this? Um, so one of the reasons that we chose this approach is because these two things work really well together. They're kind of uh, work hand in hand together. So <coughs> stacking is works really well if you have a diverse set of models that go into the ensemble. So 
Um, one sort of pretty easy way to get diversity is just to randomly generate models, because then they're pretty much different because there was, um, you know, nothing, nothing making them similar. So, as an alternative, we could do something like Bayesian hyperparameter optimization, but in that process, all the models tend to be more similar to each other, because each time it's like learning how to tweak itself a little bit in some direction to get a better result. So you kind of get this um, group of models that are all very correlated with each other. And so if you try to do stacked ensembles with that group of models, it actually doesn't work as well. So even though this is, you could say, less sophisticated um, in terms of a search, um, the result is better because we have this strong, diverse set of models, and then the, the stacked ensemble will use machine learning to figure out how to combine them together. And if there's models that are bad, it will also learn just to ignore uh, their input. So um, that's <coughs> kind of the technique that we take that seems to work well. So this is just an overview. So yeah, so this is summarizing it. That's also our sticker, which is in that little cup over there. If you want an AutoML sticker, uh, make sure to find one. Um, so basic data pre-processing, but we're adding some more sophisticated stuff with categorical uh, encodings later or right now. So we're training the random grids across all these different um, algorithms. And this part, even though um, I'm just saying, you know, quote, train a random grid, this takes a lot of time to figure out what this looks like. So we need to, for each algorithm, decide which parameters are we going to tune and what ranges are we going to look at and how much time do we allocate to this versus that and like um, so this is kind of um, not as simple as it sounds when you just say you know train a bunch of models whatever um, we have to put a lot of effort into thinking about how to best make use of our time so if you if the user says you only have one hour um, we have to figure out what's the best way to get a good model in one hour um, and then we dynamically come up with uh, some way to allocate the time across those different tasks. Um, and then we train two stacked ensembles. One of them is just an ensemble with all the models. So that's usually the best model at the end. Um, and um, however, if you're running AutoML for a long time, let's say you run it for like uh, 300 models or a thousand models or something like that then you have an ensemble that has a thousand models in it and while it might be the best performing model it's probably not the fastest model to generate predictions and deploying a 1000 model uh, ensemble into production is you know it just makes me like a little nervous to do that because <laughs> if all these models a lot more things can go wrong um, it's just a bit more complicated. So uh, as an alternative, we train another stacked ensemble, which is smaller. And um, we call that the best of family ensemble, where we just take like the best GBM, the best deep neural network, the best GeoMap, so the best from each algorithm class. And then we have kind of this lightweight ensemble, which is probably, if you're comparing all the models together, probably in second place after the all models, but it's still doing a good job and it's easy to put that into production. So it just depends on you know, what your use case is, which one you want to use. And then <clears throat> at the end of the process of AutoML, what we give you is what we call a leaderboard. So that's just a ranking of all the models in, in an order. And then whichever one's on the top is the winner. And then of course these are just all H2O models. So uh, you could choose the winner, you could choose any model from the list that you train, they're all sitting in memory waiting for you to use them, and then they're easy to deploy because these are just H2O models. So now, what does this look like? So, how many Python people do we have in the room? Okay, mostly Python people. Um, so this is what it would look like for you. So we import H2O, Let's import the AutoML functionality here. And then, uh, like I said at the very beginning, the first thing that we do is we start up the H2O cluster. That's what this does, h2o.init. 
And there's a bunch of different arguments that can be passed here, but if you, if you don't specify anything, it'll just start locally on your laptop. Um, and this is basically our equivalent of pandas read CSV, you know, so it's our uh, import file function, and you can read uh, CSV files, you can read um, all sorts of different things, um, different formats. Uh, CSV is obviously like the simplest thing, so that's what I use in the example. Um, they could be a local file, could be on the internet somewhere, um, could be an HDFS location in Hadoop, it could be all sorts of things. Um, so anyway, just loading some, you know, table, basically, of data, and that's what we call train. And then we're going to do two steps here. One, we're just going to um, create an object. Let's call it AML. That's of the H2O AutoML class. And there are several other arguments that we can specify here, but the very minimum that you need to do is just tell it how long do you want it to run for. So you could say max runtime seconds equals 600, and it will run for 10 minutes. Um, alternatively, if you want to specify the number of models, you can do that instead. So you could say run this for 20 models and then stop. Um, so you have some options about how you instruct the, the tool to, to do its work. And then once it's set up, then you um, do the dot train method, and you want to tell it which data you have. So um, if you're used to scikit-learn, the interface here is slightly different. So <clears throat> in scikit-learn, they have an X and a Y, and the X is the data, you know, the predictor columns, and Y is the response column, or you know, it's sort of like a one-column data frame thing. Um, in in H2O, we have a slightly different interface. We have something called the training frame. That's just your whole data set. It includes the all the predictors and the response. And then you just say which column is the um, thing you're trying to predict. So y equals, and then this could be whatever response column name. If, in general, your data might just have one column that's the um, response column, the outcome column, and then everything else is a predictor. But if you have other, um, like, like an ID column or a date or some other columns that you don't really need, uh, you can ignore those. Um, if you pass in x equals whatever, then you can just specify which, which subset of those columns do you actually want to use as predictors. So um, that way you don't have to create multiple copies of the data where one is like you try some set of features, one you try another set. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier. You can just always have one data frame and then try different things um, by just specifying the x argument there. So then when you hit train, then it will go off and train for a while, and then when it's done, um, we have this object here, and then one of the things in the object is the leaderboard. And I'll show you, I'll show you the leaderboard in a minute. Um, how many R people in the room? Yay! I like R. Um, so here's what it looks like in R. Uh, same thing, basically. Load the library, do the init, load some data, and then in this case, we just have one, one line of code instead of two, but the h2o.automl function, same thing. And so between our R and, and Python API, sometimes there's differences in how we um, do things. Like in the other one, you know, we first created this object, and then we invoked a dot train method. That's just a more Pythonic or kind of like scikit-learn way of doing things. Uh, so in R, we keep all the arguments named the same, so it's easy to know what's what, but then we just have a little bit different um, way that we set it up here, and then we have this leaderboard. All right, and so those of you in the room who don't want to write any code, um, then you can use, um, you can, you can use um, our GUI. So, Basically, when you start the H2O cluster on any machine, let's say you start it on your laptop, um, in the background, it's actually starting up a web server as well. So at any time when you're running the H2O cluster, if you type in uh, some uh, IP address and port, so the default is localhost port 54321, um, if you hit that in your browser, then this thing will pop up. And you can um, do everything by clicking around. 
So you can load data, click here, load some data, and then once you have some data in there, um, you can click here, run AutoML, and then this, this is the AutoML interface. So here we're actually seeing more of the arguments actually exposed than I showed in the code here. So um, you clearly probably can't read this from, from back there, but we have a training frame. Um, we have an, uh, a way where you can turn on and off different algorithms. This is actually an old screenshot because it's missing XGBoost. Um, so if you have maybe some more advanced knowledge and, and, and you know already that you don't want to, let's say you don't want to do deep learning or GLMs, you only want tree algorithms, you can just turn that off. So we'll do them all by default because we like to be more exhaustive, but if you have some advanced knowledge or you know, your preference for certain algorithms, you can turn on and off certain things. And there's a bunch of other things that you can play around with, but I won't go into detail. Okay, so this is what the leaderboard looks like. So it's essentially just a table, and inside the table we have um, model ID. So this each all represents a model that was trained, and then we have different metrics for measuring the performance. So for a binary classification data set, there's also uh, some missing that we've added since I made this screenshot. So by default, um, so you can change whatever metric you care about. So if you don't say anything, we'll just assume that we're going to sort by AUC. And we'll rank the models that way. If you want to sort by log loss, then you can put that in the um, argument when you train. And then it will sort by log loss or mean, class error, mean per class error. RMSE, MSE, and the one that's missing is um, the area under the precision recall curve. Um, yeah, so then what we see here is actually this is five-fold cross-validated AUC. So when you train um, an AutoML process, by default, unless you change it, which you can, um, it will do five-fold cross-validation of all the algorithms. So you might think that might be wasting your time. Maybe you only want to do twofold, or maybe you don't want to do cross-validation at all. Um, however, we do that by default because um, to train a stacked ensemble, you actually need to do cross-validation. Um, not, I shouldn't say you need to, but that's the best way to do it, and then you'll get the best results. There's another way where you can just um, do something, you can, generate predictions on a holdout set and train the uh, stack ensemble that way. But in general, this is like the best way to do it. You're going to get the best results, but you might want to play around with it. So if you have really big data and you don't want to imagine doing five-fold cross-validation on every model, you could turn it off and see if you can you know, get better results by being five times faster, training five times the number of models in the same amount of time. You might, um, you might get better results that way. but. Uh, and that, these are all things that we're also playing around with behind the scenes to see if we can automate some of the, these decisions for you. Um, so what we see in this leaderboard is that this um, model here is called stacked ensembles, all model, stacked ensemble, all, all models. Uh, that's the winner in this data set. Uh, the next one is the best of family AutoML. And then we have an XGBoost model. Um, a few more XGBoost, there's like five of them there. Then we have four GBMs, another XGBoost, some more GBMs, a couple of random forests, deep learning, XGBoost, deep learning, deep learning, and the very saddest model of them all is the GLM. Because GLMs, they don't do that well, but they're very interpretable, so they're highly used. But if you, you can't read these numbers, but I'll tell you the, the bottom most model, the AUC is 0.682. And then as we get up here, it's more like 7, 8, 7, 8, 3, 7, 8, 3, 7, 8, 4. And that's the highest that we get from a single model, 7, 8, 4. And then it jumps up to 7, 8, 8 and 7, 8, 9 um, for the stacked ensembles. So, OK. All right, I don't want to spend too much more time. I've been talking for a while, so I'm just going to skip over this uh, pro tips section. You can um, review this um, on the slides if you download them. Um, one thing that I will say though is 
when you run the h2o.init command, something that you're probably not used to thinking about if you do R or Python is um, how much memory usage that you want to allocate for yourself. So if you're using scikit-learn, it just uses whatever memory is available on the machine, and you know that that's that. Same with R. Uh, for H2O, we are more precise about how we allocate memory. So one of the arguments that you can set for H2O.init is how much memory you want to give this um, H2O cluster. So one of the things that you might want to think about is if you're going to train 100 models, they all have to fit in that memory, so you might want to give it more uh, memory when you start up than the default. OK. Um, OK, I just want to go pretty fast through the rest of these things. So this is some of the stuff that we'll have uh, in the future. And you might wonder um, if we're creating these tools that are auto, you know, automatic machine learning, couldn't we just go on Kaggle and win all the money, uh, right? Uh, that would be a good, good idea. Um, I would say that that is a good idea. Um, however, it doesn't uh, quite uh, work that way yet. So, um, unfortunately, humans are, unfortunately for automotive tool designers, humans are very good at, at being creative about feature engineering. And so if you give people two months um, to compete in a Kaggle competition, they're going to get very creative and do all sorts of data-related transformations that is probably um, going to help them win over just a, an algorithm-based tool. So, um, and that's actually one of the things that we do in the driverless AI. Uh, other tool that we have at HO is automatic feature engineering, and that's um, uh, kind of like we're trying to automate the hard, that's actually the more hard part than automating the modeling. Um, that's fairly straightforward um, once you have the data all ready to go. So just for uh, an example, um, if you have just like a very short time period, so Kaggle has this conference they call Kaggle Days. It's just like a one day thing where they do like an eight hour competition. And yeah, everybody competes. It's the same as a normal Kaggle competition. It's just much shorter time period. Um, if that's the case, in fact, AutoML tools are winning here. So there was this Kaggle Days San Francisco and it was basically just AutoML tools competing against each other. And actually, a human did end up winning. They got the number one score. So I, I can't say that we've solved machine learning in general. But um, you know, we're getting there. And um, this, this tool came in number eight. Uh, I just ran it for 100 minutes and just was done. And then there's the score. So if, if you give people long enough, they're going to be more creative than an AutoML tool. But, we might, um, that might change over time. So, and if you want to know more about how H2O AutoML compares to, there's a, there's a handful of other open source AutoML tools. There's not very many, but there's a handful. Um, you can visit this benchmark that I, along with a bunch of other AutoML tool makers, um, created together. Because some, the thing about benchmarks is that usually the person who makes the benchmark is winning the benchmark. So that's why most benchmarks are not good. So we as an AutoML community came together and decided upon like what is a fair benchmark and then we all competed together. I think that's the only way to really do proper benchmarking. And I'll just skip through the results because I don't want to spend any more time. And if you don't want to read that paper and you want this um, nice lady uh, to read it to you, there's something called the Kaggle Reading Group um, where they, once a week, this woman, Rachel, who works at Kaggle, reads papers, and so she read our paper in one hour. So if you're feeling tired and want someone to read you a bedtime story, um, there you go. Okay, so here's some links, and um, these, are, these are the best places to go learn. So this is the documentation, the user guide for AutoML. And then we have little tutorials that will teach you how to do it in R and Python. You pretty much already know everything just by seeing that one line of code, but um, this will help you, um, you know, you can copy paste it and then be done. Okay, so this is just more, more links to all the things. And um, yeah, this, this is actually the link 
the full length of uh, link for where the slides go for for this talk. So um, I'll stop there and I'll just ask if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Why the choice of Java? Why Java? Oh, that's a good question. Um, people do ask that often. So um, well, we wanted something fast, so that rules out quite a bit. So or a fast compiled language, so maybe C++ or Java. And the reason Rust. that we, what's that? Rust. Rust. Yeah, we could have done Rust. Yeah, I mean, so the reason that, um, that we chose Java is one, it's still like widely used in enterprise systems and it's, you know, popular. But the real reason is that the co-founder of H2O is like this famous Java guy who invented the Java hotspot compiler. And so he worked at Sun Microsystems uh, in the 90s and was like super Java guy. So that's why. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I think that, that you run most of the models on the <coughs> GPU, not in Java. Um, <clears throat> not for H2O. So um, for if you remember back in 2012 when we started this project, GPUs were still not quite popular for doing machine learning. Um, now they are. So this whole framework is built for CPUs. And the only algorithm inside of H2O that can be run on GPUs is XGBoost. And that's just a third party library. So that's another thing that there's more of a focus on GPUs and the driverless AI. So this one is just, you know, this has been around for a while and so we can't uh, very easily change it now. So CPU, um, but good question. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, in the back there. Can AutoML automatically recognize the target variable, or how? Um, no, there's no nothing really that we could just looking at a stack of columns figure out which is the thing you're trying to predict. So that is one of the only things that, as a user, you have to tell it what what you want. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, the question is regarding uh, the level I can customize the system up to. Yeah. Because let's say I have a recommendation task and I have like logs from the website and I have to recommend item from it. So I have some place to, you know, write my physical code and say how to transform the one to another, yeah. which matter, uh, pro directly program metrics in some language according to which I mean ranking metric. Mm -hmm. which is used in recommendations, probably not out of the box, so I would like to call this inside. And is there any ways to do such things? Um, <clears throat> so one, there's two options. One is if you have a metric that we don't have that you would like to see in there, we can add it if it makes sense. Um, another option is if we don't have the resources to do it, you can, it's open source, you can add it yourself. The third option would be just to um, <clears throat> use H2O just as it is, and then use the predictions, and then use some other, like a Python library that can compute your metric by just giving the predictions and the label, and then, um, but we couldn't, then we couldn't optimize for that. We could compute it after the fact, but in order to actually optimize for anything, like that would have to go inside of H2O as a part of it. So, it might be tricky. Okay. <laughs> It's doable, but it's it de it depends maybe. So I, 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 I would try. It means I would faster made it in pure Python without H2O. I would say. Maybe it depends. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask uh, which precautions does Auto um, uh, take uh, uh, to avoid uh, overfitting, to over avoid uh, heavy biasing of the model, cause. Uh, um, this uh, heavy boosting or stacking uh, evokes me uh, really like a, a tendency uh, to have the model, uh, say, crippled by, by, by too much bias immediately. Mm -hmm. So uh, which measures do you take to, to reduce the dimensionality, to reduce the size of the problem, to bring in certain robustness? So we just use um, pretty standard methods of um, of uh, validation, so we would just use cross-validation to, to measure, um, we've kind of like, in the early stopping parameters, there's three things that you can specify, so you can say which metric are you looking at, so that's like AUC or something, um, and then we have um, something called stopping tolerance, and then stopping rounds, 
And those two things control how sensitive we are to, um, like if you, you can imagine like the curve, um, uh, like if you're trying to not overfit, you have a curve where you have the training error and then you have like the validation error. And you want to make sure that you stop kind of when the validation error starts to go up. And um, so there's kind of this flat area in between where you want to stop. And so we have a way of like specifying like how flat and for how long uh, do you let that be before you cut it off. And so that's um, something that we have some defaults for, but you can also play around with it. So if you find that H2O is you know, maybe stopping too early or stopping too late, you can tweak that number a little bit so that it's more or less sensitive. Yeah, but just standard like validation metrics. Mm -hmm. so maybe one more question? Yeah. Uh, do you support more uh, ROS function or uh, if, I, uh, if I have uh, some custom ROS function, so do you apply it? Or? Um, so yes and no. So we have a way, so it's kind of complicated because everything's in Java and so you know, it would be nice to not have to write Java code to do that. So what we did was, for some algorithms, which you can have a custom loss function like the GBM, um, for example, um, so just the algorithm itself supports that. So then we, what we did was, there's a way to sort of write um, code in Python, just define your loss function, and then um, you essentially point to that actually, is it Veronica that has a good blog post about that? Somebody, or is it Hansa? Yeah, Veronica in the back. She has a whole blog post about how to do that. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, she's the one that you want to talk to, but um, or you can read her blog post. But you just write some Python code and define your loss function, and then you can uh, sort of point to it. It lives in a file, like basically, like a little Python file, and with the function definition, and then uh, we'll optimize that instead of the things that are internal to H2O. But it's only supported in Python, so, yeah. And GBM. And for GBMs, yeah. And I think, uh, I can't remember, it's definitely on our roadmap to add it to h I can't remember if we've actually, or sorry, to AutoML. Um, I can't remember if we've actually added it yet or not. I don't think we have, but it's, it's very easy just to add that one argument and use the code that they wrote to, to do that and then it would just apply to the GBMs and then you would have different um, defaults for the other ones. Okay, so I'll just leave it there so we have enough time for our next speaker. Um, so thank you very much and if you have more questions at the end we can chat later. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I would like, first of all, to thank for the uh, invitation and uh, nice to see so many uh, people interested in this topic or at least in machine learning. Uh, what this topic is about, uh, well, uh, there are some questions. What, what does it uh, mean? Uh, if you do not understand the title, don't panic. <laughs> there is time to uh, understand. Uh, I, I will go uh, through the slides and uh, I believe that you will not only understand the title, but uh, you will also find it uh, useful in many of, or some of your applications. Uh, so, uh, what it will be about? Uh, it will be about uh, vertical search planning in our uh, search engine, especially uh, we will be interested how to um, estimate performance of some uh, model. Uh, we show that uh, the, this uh, specific problem or this problem leads to um, uh, partial feedback system. This is some kind of abstraction and uh, then there will be some time to go through this uh, abstraction and uh, show some methods uh, evaluating the performance. And finally, we apply the, this framework to our problem. Well, so let's, let's start. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would like uh, to introduce Seznam. I'm not sure if every, everyone here knows it. 
We are a Czech uh, web portal. We have several services and uh, the most important for us will be the web search engine. Uh, I will show our home page. Uh, maybe. Uh, I'm sorry, there is some problem with resolution, so you, you, you see only part of that. But uh, you can see that there are some news and uh, many more, but uh, what I said, the most important part for our talk, it's also the part where I work, is uh, search engine. So I suppose that everyone knows what uh, search engine means. So if I ask a query, then I get a result. Oh, it's nice. And uh, this, this result contains uh, traditional, we say organic results, you know, from Google it's the same basically. There are uh, 10 uh, organic results. And then uh, there are also some, we call it verticals. And uh, this vertical is for instance image. And uh, these uh, images are blended into, between the organic uh, results. And uh, the problem we are facing is how to blend uh, these uh, verticals into the into the organi organic results. Uh, well, so it's problem what we are solving, and uh, let's see what has came. So, if I'm a user, I'm uh, asked the query marks and so the. Uh, search result, uh, search engine result page, this is a shortcut. <laughs> uh, and uh, as I, as me as a user, I uh, saw, saw the result and uh, browse, scroll for instance, uh, take some time on that, and then I make some click for uh, if, if it. Uh, if the result uh, uh, finds my expectation. And uh, up to uh, Seznam, it is, uh, we would like to have uh, satisfied users, and uh, the satisfaction is uh, observed only through, through this uh, feedback. Well, uh, so uh, it was from the user point of view, and now uh, we are not only user, we are, uh, we would like to know how the system works. So if I ask uh, the query Mars, then uh, there are asked uh, several services, some of them respond. Uh, so we, uh, we, uh, we receive uh, available uh, verticals, uh, there, there is, uh, there are, uh, then uh, organic results, and uh, then there are some other types. This, uh, this, uh, this is basically uh, input to our model. It's called plugin policy, uh, together with, uh, for instance, features like uh, query itself, uh, hardware, and uh, many, many more. And the goal of the logging policy is to uh, compose the, the set. Uh, well, it is quite difficult to make it at once, so uh, we made some simplification that uh, the login policy uh, basically predict uh, probability that uh, one uh, particular vertical will be chosen, and then there is some random trial. We, we just uh, sample from the distribution and select, uh, select the winning action. Well, uh, once we uh, make the first position, we remove, here, here there's 47% for organic results, it's placed on the first place, and uh, then the organic result is uh, removed from list, and goes again to the uh, login policy with some new propensities and so on. So uh, this is the way we are uh, composing the SERP. And uh, now the critical problem is when uh, we have one model and we would like to improve that, 
how to uh, get now that the new the update will be better. So we are interested in the measurement, the performance measurement of, of the new model. Okay, so that, that, that we would like, uh, that's the way what, well, well that, that partly explains the title. <laughs> uh, so uh, I summarize the talk, uh, or what, what I would like to achieve in this talk. Uh, First, uh, I, I introduced the problem and uh, I would like to uh, show that it's an uh, instance of some kind of abstraction called partial feedback system. Uh, then we will spend some time to, uh, to check uh, the possibilities of performance evaluation in, in these partial feedback systems. Uh, well, and finally, we uh, apply this framework to our problem. Well, uh, the holy grail of this uh, talk would be if you uh, can imagine some your application and uh, release it is also partial feedback system and uh, apply the, this framework to. Well, uh, some hints uh, or some uh, tips. Uh, of system that uh, leads also to the uh, partial feedback system is, for instance, a uh, spell checker in a, a search engine. Because uh, if user asks query, we can uh, we can uh, make a correction or we can uh, put it uh, search it as it is, and we get different results. And uh, we know. Uh, or we do not know what is the correct uh, correct uh, it, it, it is correct to make correction or uh, add the original uh, query. So all the thing we have is uh, feedback from the user, and uh, this is common. Uh, this is a common part for all all the systems, uh, for instance, uh, recommender and and so on. Okay, so let's start with the partial feedback uh, system abstraction. Uh, th there are some basic uh, definitions. Uh, do not do be afraid. Uh, I, I try to make uh, some analogy also with the supervised learning, so I believe that everyone will uh, be able to understand it well. So uh, we have a context. Uh, it's, for instance, query or I don't know uh, the device of the user, and it is drawn according so, to some distribution, which we uh, are, uh, well, it's from from some distribution. Then we have an action. The action is it could be, uh, for instance, the cho chosen vertical it means uh, we can choose uh, image or we can choose some picture and so on. And uh, this uh, is uh, drawn according to policy or given model. Then we have a reward function. Uh, this is quite... Uh, well, this, this is basically what we would like to uh, ma maximize. Uh, it, it's, it's it's well for instance it could be a colleague and uh, it uh, it is something that indicates if the user was satisfied or not and then uh, we have uh, the goal or our goal is to maximize the expected uh, reward the expected received reward uh, well we use some map but to be scared the most sophisticated uh, operation would be expectation so. Uh, this is formal definition of we, what we would like to optimize. Uh, as a, well, uh, now, what is crucial is that uh, we have a partial feedback only. It means that uh, we received a feedback only for one given action that was selected. Not, uh, we 
have no idea what would happen if we would select uh, a different one. Uh, well, uh, to make the analogy for, from uh, with classical machine learning, supervised learning, then context is the same. You can imagine, for instance, to list a uh, data set or list task. Uh, so uh, you have uh, X would be an image, then uh, Y would be a label, uh, and uh, the label, uh, the pi, it's propensity in uh, this counterfactual setting and it corresponds to a uh, posterior uh, predictive distribution of some discriminative model that is trained on uh, in full, 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 full feedback system. Uh, then we have a, a reward function and its counterpart would be a loss function uh, uh, yeah, loss and uh, respectively negative of the, of the loss. So we would like to uh, minimize the loss and now we would like to maximize the reward. Uh, okay, and the most important part that uh, in, uh, in the case of NAST, we have uh, one image and uh, well, we know the res response of for all possible. Uh, Actions. So we know that uh, one image could be either one, two, three, four, and so on. And uh, we, we, the label is that it is, for instance, four. But we know for all of the other lab, uh, images that it is not true. But this is not the case in the partial feedback system. In partial feedback system, you just select one action, and uh, it, it, it will be missed. If I select uh, four, that the feedback would be it's correct, or if it would be uh, something else, then uh, the answer would be no, it's not correct, and so. Okay, so uh, this is a par partial feedback system. Well, uh, and there is one more uh, assumption about station stationarity. It means that the policy should not uh, first, uh, uh, the distribution should not time, uh, change with time. And also uh, that the policy should not depend, uh, sorry, affect the input distribution Px, which is not strictly true, and we have to care, uh, pay some attention on that. Okay, so that's the pressure feedback system, it's a large part of title. Now, uh, what are the criteria of such estimate? Well, uh, we have a true reward, and uh, th there is an expectation which uh, needs uh, analytical form of uh, the reward function, which is not available, of course. So we have only some samples, and uh, we approach this true reward, uh, reward uh, expected reward only from something simple. So uh, this uh, reward is random. And uh, we will be interested in two uh, quantities. The first one is bias, and the second one is uh, variance. Uh, well, uh, the, the unbiased uh, method means that uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, orange one. It has zero, zero uh, mean, but it's much larger variance than. To do one. Okay. Well, so uh, I said that uh, we, we are interested in uh, of, of, in evaluation. So uh, there, there was a keyword offline, uh, then, but uh, it is possible to make it also, also online. Uh, it means that uh, we uh, have a new model and deploy that in production. Uh, we collect. Uh, we collect some data and uh, it can be shown that uh, it directly uh, approximated the uh, desired reward. So uh, this method, method is uh, very straightforward. Uh, there is no, no need of uh, these uh, the, the assumptions and uh, 
Uh, well, so we, we can say that uh, the problem is solved, <laughs> but uh, there are also some problems with, the, uh, with this method. Uh, first of all, the method must be uh, deployed in production. So you have to uh, program or you, you have to uh, program it uh, in the production quality, then uh, it uh, takes some time to, uh, to collect sufficient uh, many data for the policy evolution. Another, another drawback is that uh, if you test uh, bad policy, you, can, uh, you are actually showing the bad results to users, which, which is also not very good. And uh, it, it, well, it means that it's difficult. And the, the last point is that uh, we can test only one method in one time. In time, so if you would like to test many methods, then uh, it's it could be problematic. Okay, so uh, it would be have to, nice to have some alternative, but before that, uh, just a simple. Uh, simple example how to uh, calculate the reward. It's nothing surpri surprising that the expectation is just a numerical average. And well, uh, it means that uh, if I have such, such data, then I just I, I need only the only the reward and uh, have a direct reward uh, expectation. Uh, Estimate of reward. Okay, so uh, let's look for an alternative for uh, of, of online learning. The first one is uh, well, sorry. Uh, well, uh, so I, I formalized the problem. Uh, we have some data that are uh, recorded according to logging policy, some model. Uh, uh, say any details on that, just one. And then uh, we have the new policy and we ask uh, how to use the data that are uh, produced by the login policy for evaluation of the new one. Clear. Yeah, well, uh, if we uh, can make it, then uh, we solve the problem of A-B test because it's cheap, we can uh, as many as many policies as we want. I can make it even in my Jupyter notebook. I don't need uh, some production quality, and uh, well, uh, it can be also then used for uh, training. Uh, there are some challenges with that. Uh, but one would say that uh, we, we can make average as before, but uh, the problem is that the data are not collect, uh, collected according to, to the alternative policy. So uh, the direct uh, calculation of the uh, mean as before leads to estimation of the uh, of the logging policy, but it's not what we need. And uh, another challenge is. Uh, once we make some estimate, the problem is uh, how to how to check that it is valid because uh, it's only an offline estimate. So uh, we introduce some validity, uh, some sanity checks, and these sanity checks uh, are actually does not actually say say us that uh, the estimate is correct, but uh, it said us uh, if something is does not hold. Uh, the the estimate is not reliable, so we can uh, we can actually uh, pro provide several restrictions and find that, find that uh, when it is valid. But uh, the final validity should be uh, confirmed only with the uh, with the A/B test, as, as I said. Okay, so uh, I I spent a few time. Uh, some time to uh, intro in for in introduction several methods uh, solving this uh, missing feedback. The first one is uh, direct reward estimator. It means that uh, we uh, train a model, 
some, some regression, which actually, actually, um, actually predict the reward. Uh, in, the, in the supervised comp uh, complement, it seems quite funny because it's something, uh, the loss function is uh, almost always uh, available for every, every bar, uh, every data. And uh, in fact, here we are trying to predict the loss function in this analogy. So, uh, but uh, but uh, this reward uh, is actually quite complex, and uh, the prediction often does not work well. Uh, we use. Uh, well, if you would like to derive that, uh, it's quite straightforward. We, we just use the uh, model instead of true uh, parameter, and then, according to Monte Carlo, uh, uh, Monte Carlo approximation, we uh, arrive at straightforward for formula. So, uh, again, if we, if we uh, arrive at this concrete example, we can see that uh, the reward is uh, estimated uh, only on uh, only based on the model prediction from the data set we need only the uh, distribution only distribution of the data themselves uh, we don't we don't not, not utilize the uh, propensity of the policy or uh, the reward that was uh, collected by policy. Okay, so we, we, we get some estimate which seems to be quite reasonable, but uh, for the data, these data, we are not able to, uh, well, it's just demonstration, it's not, uh, it's, we cannot expect that uh, according to four or six uh, data points, we are able to <laughs> estimate the model properties. Okay, uh, a completely uh, different approach is uh, is used in uh, inverse propensity score estimator. Uh, in the direct method, we, we tried to um, estimate the word, uh, I, mean, I mean the um, reward function, but now uh, we, instead of uh, estimating the reward function, we try to somehow fix the distribution that uh, the, 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 the data approach, I mean the, from the logging policy, and uh, use it for uh, the alternative policy. Uh, it can be shown that uh, it is actually this equality that uh, multiplying by this term, we uh, arrive from the logging policy to uh, sorry from the alternative policy to the logging policy, and uh, now we achieve what we uh, we actually need because uh, the pro the original problem was that uh, the data was were not collected according to distribution we needed, but uh, making this smart uh, step, we can uh, now uh, directly. Uh, use Monte Carlo uh, approximation to estimate the uh, the, the reward. Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, we do not need any uh, estimate of of true reward. Uh, so the, this estimate is not uh, does not suffer the problem by the problem. Uh, and it can be shown that uh, this estimate is uh, unbiased and uh, it's uh, it first with high variance. Uh, I show later why. Uh, but uh, well, it it can be also seen here that uh, the logging policy must be uh, random. It should not uh, it shouldn't be deterministic because. Uh, there is a division by uh, pi zero, and uh, deterministic policy means that uh, there is no, uh, there is a, the term will be zero, so the estimate will be infinite, and uh, it makes no sense. 
OK, so let's again see the example. Uh, we can... Uh, he, here we actually uh, use only three data points because uh, as you can see, the alternative policy uh, select the same, uh, the same uh, action as the logging policy. And uh, this, this is actually the reason why, uh, why uh, IPS estimate has so, much, uh, so high variant because it uh, efficiently uses much less points in the Monte Carlo estimation. Monte Carlo estimation. So it's intuitively uh, why uh, why it has much uh, higher variance. Uh, and there is another point. Uh, it's one can see that uh, we are actually estimating click-through rate, which should uh, range from 0 to 1, and this estimate gives uh, 70, which is uh, completely out, out of uh, range. The problem is that the propensity here is uh, very low. So the reliability of this estimate uh, depends on the uh, portion that we have. Uh, because here it uh, occurred quite uh, uh, quite uh, improbable event because it's, uh, there is only one person that it would happen and we have only six data points so one, one could feel that uh, there is quite imbalance in this and uh, this is actually what is, what, what, what is, what is some kind of overfitting on uh, some kind of overfitting because uh, the estimate would uh, more reflect this singularity or quite improbable event than the uh, true remote estimate. So if I summarize, summarize these two approaches, uh, the direct method is quite straightforward. It tries to uh, model the, uh, the reward function. It has it suffered some bias by some bias because uh, uh, the, the model of the reward could, uh, is oft, often difficult, uh, whereas the IPS is unbiased and uh, but uh, suffers with high variance. So uh, there are some uh, advanced methods uh, that uh, could that uh, handle the disadvantages to uh, of this method uh, of the IPS and direct method. Uh, the first one is double robust estimator and the second one is self-normalized. Uh, I will just uh, quick, quickly go through them. Uh, the self-normalized uh, estimator just uh, tries to uh, reduce the variance by uh, normalization or regularization constant. Uh, the idea is that this constant should be uh, 1 as n tends to infinity, infinity, so we add some bias, but this bias should be uh, small because uh, as, as the constant uh, tends to it 0, then there will be actually no bias, and uh, we uh, reduce the variance. So, uh, well, and there is one more important point that we since we do not need uh, the estimate of uh, of the reward, uh, we can actually use this uh, estimation, uh, this kind of estimation for any type of uh, of any uh, metric that is uh, recorded for in some some valid time, or you can imagine uh, any feedback metric, and uh, this uh, metric is possible can be estimated by using this estimator uh, without necessity to model it. It's a huge advantage uh, which, uh, which motivates us actually to use this estimator uh, in our uh, problem I will show later. Well, uh, I, I, I will just show again the example. Uh, we, we can see that, um, that uh, Using this normalization, we get something between uh, 0 and 1, which is quite reasonable, but uh, still, uh, this 
very small and unprobable event is dominating. So uh, the estimate would, would, would be uh, it partly fixes the problem of, uh, uh, of of IPS, but it does not solve it uh, at all. Okay. Uh, well, uh, one more thing that I forgot to mention is that the normalization constant should be one, and uh, it is also proposed uh, proposed by Thorsten Jakims and uh, the second guy as a uh, sanity check for the estimate. It means that uh, if the constant is far from one, we said that the estimate is not valid because um, the assumption is the, simply does not hold. Okay, so uh, it's the first sanity check we will use later. Well, and the last uh, estimator is double robust. Uh, it's maybe looks terrible, but uh, it, it's quite easy because it uh, basically combine uh, the, the, the direct and IPS method and combine that in that way that uh, there is a direct method, this is the first part, and uh, IPS, uh, IPS estimate of uh, the, this difference. The idea is that uh, if either direct method of, or IPS method is correct, then the double robust gives the correct result. Uh, to get some intuition, why, why does it hold? Uh, if you have uh, IPS estimate that is uh, unbiased, but it has high variance, and direct method which has low variance, but it's biased, uh, then if, if you sum that, you get the uh, blue line, which is uh, biased and uh, also had very large uh, variance. But uh, if you make the uh, IPS estimate of the correction term, it is actually this one, uh, it is also uh, the it, it, it's also biased and uh, it has larger variance, so you can uh, somehow fix uh, or uh, combine the properties, or the good properties of both estimators so that you get uh, in ideal uh, un unbiased estimator with low variance. So that's the idea behind the double robust. Uh, Another feature is that uh, this estimator used, uh, uses all data we have available. So we have set, it uses the data, data set, the complete data set, and also the, predict, uh, the model that predicts the world. So uh, from the intuition, intuition this, um, this should be the best model because it uses the, all, the, all data we have available. So it's, uh, that's, also the motivation for using that. Okay, so uh, now we have several methods uh, how to provide of policy evaluation of partial feedback system. And uh, now uh, we, we didn't say anything about training. Uh, well, uh, when we have uh, defined the optimization objective, uh, well, we, I already uh, shown in several ways. We can uh, also uh, find some way how to uh, this optimization objective uh, optimize. The first approach is direct method. It means that uh, we uh, train the predictor for all possible actions, basically the work model, as I said before. And then uh, we apply that to choose the best action uh, according to the predicted reward. And the second approach is uh, a contrafactual approach. Uh, it looks on that from a little bit different way because uh, in direct method you need uh, to make basically a regression model for all possible actions. 
which is quite complex task. And in the second task, uh, in the second step, you need to select the best uh, best reward. Uh, if you think about that, uh, if you have a few discrete action, it's the selection is a classification task. So uh, this is the way uh, how the contrafactual or this is the contrafactual approach. Uh, I, I will not talk about the details. If someone is interested in, I recommend the tutorial from Tostun Jakims from CKR uh, 2016. Uh, for us, it is important that uh, this algorithm is implemented and we can simply use it uh, in both part of it. I'm not sure it, if it's also implemented in H, H2, H2O, <laughs> but probably, I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, well, if, if you are interested in this kind of training, uh, I recommend to see the uh, GitHub. There are uh, very, very simple examples and uh, we actually used to write, write them, <laughs> not just them. Okay, so now we have everything we need. We uh, know uh, how to evaluate the of policy, uh, policy in offline way, and also uh, we uh, we know how to train the model, or at least we we are able to use the software to use it uh, to train it. So uh, let's start. Let's join the first and second part together. Uh, we define two setups. The first, the first one is a preposition setup, where basically uh, the context is um, the the context is uh, the query and feature uh, it corresponding features. And uh, as, as I said, it's preposition, so it's fixed for position. So. Uh, there are also uh, actions that are uh, that, that were selected on the other position above. This is the context. The, re uh, the reward is only click. An action is uh, what, what uh, vertical is selected at the given position, and uh, propensity is clearly locked uh, as uh, as I shown in the first uh, slide. Well, since there is a low number number of actions, we can expect the reasonable value of propensities. So we can uh, expect that the uh, analysis I said before uh, should be valid. Uh, but the problem of this setup is that uh, the interpretation is not clear, except in the first position where we just say that uh, the expected reward is number of clicks of the first position. But uh, on the page, uh, for example, for its position, it says what is the re what would be the reward if uh, the login policy would be uh, applied for the first position, first three position, and on the fourth position uh, there would be the alternative position, uh, alternative policy. Uh, so uh, it tell us something, but uh, it's not nothing uh, what the management would like to hear. So we also uh, consider another setup, and it's complete cell. Uh, here, uh, the context is just uh, uh, just the feature of, of, of features of the concrete query means query and so on. Uh, the reward function is any feedback measure on complete cell. And uh, the action now is uh, complete set composition. Uh, the propensities can be uh, calculated according to chain rule since uh, we said that the result on the first uh, second position depends only on the first position. The result on the third position depends only uh, on uh, results on the first and second position and so on. So uh, it's possible to apply this chain rule to express the propensity. Uh, the problem is that uh, with uh, well, uh, and uh, the interpretation is then quite clear because uh, 
we we can uh, we can uh, we basically report the final uh, reward function. The problem is that uh, if we multiply uh, many small numbers, then we get extra small number which cause the problem uh, with small propensities, propensities as I showed before. So uh, we consider a parameter k, which is the serp length. Uh, it actually means uh, how much position of serp do we consider. Uh, we can consider first one, only first position, then uh, th this setup will be this equal with the previous one for the first position. But uh, we can uh, balance uh, with this para parameter the problem of the expressiveness. It means uh, what, what actually the result tell us. And on the other hand, we can uh, handle the complexity uh, that, uh, that results in uh, complexity and in consequence, the validity of, of the relevant estimation. Okay, so uh, now this is just a summary of these the pre previous three, two slides. Uh, action for first position, this is uh, result on one position in the, in the serve, it's complete serve. Uh, the propensity is just a single number. Uh, of and it's directly low. Uh, in the s s second case, it's product, uh, which is a little bit more complex, uh, and so on. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the purpose, how, how we use that, is that we use the f fixed position setup for the training, mo for training models. And uh, then uh, we evaluate it on complete set. It, it would actually give us the result the management would like to say, uh, to see, uh, I mean, the complete result. Okay. So, the time is coming. So, uh, th there is one more uh, sanity check that is induced uh, by our data set, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, based on uh, non-decreasing uh, property of uh, click-through rate, I mean that uh, if I provide the evaluation on the first position and make uh, and sum the, all, all the clicks, then I, I get some number, and uh, if I make it for the first two positions, then the number must be at least the same or probably higher. So if the police, uh, if, if, if the police estimates uh, say me that uh, that uh, this this function this function of, of S would, would not be monolithical, then there is a problem. So it's another sanity check we will use uh, during our evaluation. Okay, so just summary of uh, evolution setup. We uh, train the double robust, uh, double, uh, all the methods we, uh, I said. I talked about uh, using Opal web uh, and uh, evaluated the self normalized APS estimates. And we add uh, also logging and random policies. Uh, we apply the sanity checks, I can talk about, and uh, evaluated metric. Well, uh, and our goal was to find the trade-off parameter k uh, uh, such that the k should be as large as possible, but uh, the result should still be uh, a reasonable value. values. Uh, it means that they would not uh, valid, uh, violate the sanity checks. Okay, so these are some results. Uh, on, on our data, we can see that uh, we applied both sanity checks. The IPS, uh, the IPS estimator does not fit the first sanity check with uh, normalization constant that should be one. And uh, we found that uh, it is uh, it is reliable to consider only two first two positions because on the third position then the sanity check is violated.
So uh, our interpretation is that uh, we uh, we can consider only first two positions. Uh, well, that's not too much. Uh, the, re the reason is probably that uh, our policy, uh, our logging policy, does not uh, randomize as it should. <laughs> Because uh, if it would uh, randomize better, then uh, or it would uh, randomize more, then uh, we, we expect that uh, the result should be better. Okay, so some concluding result, uh, remarks. Uh, we, we show that uh, the of policy evaluation uh, it has some good. Uh, Properties uh, it saves a lot of resources, so it can be uh, used as either alternative, alternative or complement for uh, A/B testing. Then, uh, then policy evaluation in past feedback system is uh, not for free because you can either use A/B a -B testing when you uh, spend resources for uh, for some method that could. That is possibly not uh, optimal, or you can use uh, offline evaluation, but then you need some randomization, and uh, this randomization also is also not for, for free. Uh, we talk about the uh, validity issue uh, and the importance of sanity checks that actually uh, bounded on our uh, re reliability region. Uh, we outlined uh, how to. Uh, of policy learned data, at least uh, by software, <laughs> and uh, also if uh, someone is uh, some someone is interesting, we re release the data set from our uh, search engine that is uh, available on GitHub. Uh, you can reproduce these uh, results or play it with uh, more. Uh, the problem of the, the data set is, as I said, it. It does not uh, randomize too much, so it's not well uh, suited for contrafactual analysis. But uh, it's still uh, there's still a lot of data from uh, real traffic that could be interesting, interesting for everyone. Okay, so uh, these are the references. Uh, maybe I, I would like to point out the tutorial from Torsten Jakins. Uh, it basically covers the second part uh, of this talk and uh, the third part is covered in uh, our CKR publication where we describe the data set. Okay, so uh, if someone would like to uh, uh, is interested in this problem, you can uh, ch check if you would like to join us and that's all so, I'm so thank you for your attention and now if you have a question I hope that uh, you, you did not got lost so early so if you have any question if I can make something clear uh, if I understand right, you try to evaluate some models, yes, using this uh, technique of offline evaluation. Yeah. So, did you try to make then AP testing and recheck your how well, well evaluation? That's good, good, good question. <laughs> we actually did not uh, so far because it has no priority. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> so, it's, uh, it's uh, in progress. Well, not progress. It's it's waiting. But uh, we are in touch with uh, some other groups uh, working on this approach. And uh, what I have messages that some somewhere it uh, it was okay. It, uh, the results were, were uh, as expected, and somewhere somewhere it does, does not work. So uh, it's if you use it, it's not still uh, you you are not still confident that uh, it will work fine in A/B test or it will match the final result. So it's, uh, we, we're still waiting for this. <laughs> okay, other questions?
Okay, so if there is no question, there are no questions. Thank you. If if you, if you have anything later, feel free to contact me and can discuss. Thank you.